package. And now, please give a warm welcome to Senior Vice President of Education at the Kennedy Center, Mario Rosero. Good evening, how's everyone doing tonight? Great, thank you so much for coming out. This is a special week and a special week in a special year. Uh, yesterday, the Kennedy Center celebrated its 46th birthday, so we're really thrilled about that. And also, this year has been um, the 100th centennial for President Kennedy, and at the end of May, we would have celebrated his 100th birthday. So um, as we reflected upon his legacy, for which this building is a memorial to, uh, we really thought about his impact on the world and society. And when we think about um, his connection to the arts and artists, we came up with what we call our JFK ideals. And these are words of service, justice, freedom, courage, and gratitude. And in order to honor that legacy and to really think about what our national um, call, our national duty is for the arts across the country, we started a program called the Citizen Artist Fellows. And these are artists from communities large and small all across the nation that really live up to those JFK ideals. And they have an impact on their communities and they really give back. So we are in our second cohort. I'm surrounded by our friends and our, our fellows um, on stage and in the audience tonight. We've been um, really working hard over the last few days having a retreat to really talk about their work um, in their cities, their communities across the country, as well as how we might work together. So I'm really thrilled that they can share some of their work with you tonight. And we have a first time ever collaborative piece that we are unveiling. So this is very exciting for us. So can I just have a little shout out, maybe some hands in the audience for our, our fellows that are out in the audience tonight? They're right in the front, yeah, thanks guys. And it's my pleasure to introduce uh, behind me, we have Executive Director for El Sistema USA, Katie Wyatt. Violinist and founder of Street, Street Symphony in LA, Vijay Gupta, as well as composer Rina Esmel. We also have poet Hakeem Bellamy from Albuquerque, New Mexico. And last but not least, artist and activist Dee Nichols from St. Louis. Thank you for joining us. Enjoy your evening. I was by myself the first time I ever went out there. It was August 12th, 2014, around 9.30 p.m. ish. Hot, not too humid, but you could tell that something, something was in the air. When I arrived, I was leaving a meeting dressed in a business suit, not sure what to do, not sure of who I would find, because the media told me that out there on the streets of West Florissant, there were thugs. There were people who deserved to die. It was a state of emergency. But when I arrived, that wasn't it at all. There were strong people, resilient women, queer folks, people coming together to rise up and say to, in, in, in protest that we deserve the right to live. We deserve humanity. We deserve dignity. We deserve the right to walk down our streets and not worry about cops coming upon us and shooting us down. When I left that night, it was because there was a flash, there was a truth 
of officers who came our way, pointed guns at our faces, rise and shine their lights, and before they could blind us, I don't think they realized who we were. The clips that you just saw were video footage from my first night on the streets in Ferguson, Missouri. I live 20 minutes away from where Michael Brown was shot. And after that night, my first night ever protesting, I was so shaken to my core, thinking about the people who had been dehumanized in this process of terror, of militarized police, of tanks, of trauma, of burning gas stations. And I was haunted night after night, and I kept coming back again and again. And in those nightmares that I would have, there was the constant image of this casket. It was made completely out of mirrors, hidden in the darkness of the night, and I couldn't shake it. As an arts organizer on the ground, all I knew to do was to make something, was to bring people together and create something. And so we did. Taking those images out of my head, I reached out to as many artists as possible in our city who had found themselves, like myself, on the streets of Ferguson. Calling ourselves Art of This STL, we collaborated to help me get rid of this nightmare in my head. You see, I have brothers, seven brothers. And my youngest brother, Michael, Michael Ross, all that he ever wanted to be in life and aspire towards is to be like Michael Jackson. But we live in a system that is so set upon making him another Michael Brown. And so I called all the men, all the artist men, to help me build. In this image that you see are the starting and the beginnings of what became the mirror casket, based in wood, covered entirely on all of its sides with mirrors. And during the weekend of Ferguson October, it was carried throughout all the marches as people from all across the nation in the world came to our city, the heart of this nation, to stand up against br and police brutality with us. On the sides of this mirror, as men carried it in the streets, you could see yourself, clear image, a clear invitation, welcoming you to take part, to see yourself in the fate of all of us whose lives have been th threatened throughout those nights. In these clear images, it was our hope that you would empathize that you would see the connections and the links between our humanity and yours. And on the face of this object, this casket, this artifact, this, this war tool, was a cracked surface. And whenever the men who carried it would stop marching, they would present it to the oppressor. In this case, the police. And on the face of this object, this casket made out of mirrors, a shattered image appeared. And in the distortion, you, if you looked into it, much like the cops who stood before us, would then be ignited to think and consider, well, what is the role that I've played in all of these unrest, in all of these issues? This object was carried night after night 
and day after day, as more and more protesters, activists, organizers, clergy, students, families, young people, children, babies, came into the streets just to stand in solidarity with a teenager, with a kid who was supposed to go to college the Monday after he was shot, murdered in our streets. As we carried these objects throughout the city, they started to gain more and more traction and more and more attention. And these pieces, as they would be presented to officer after officer, would find themselves staring in the faces of eyes that had been averted, that no one really wanted to face themselves. No one really wanted to face this sense of humanity that we had brought upon ourselves. No one wanted to, to have that honesty, that check-in to say yes, in as much as we could all be the figures in this object, we also all contribute to the issues, the problems, the reasons why there are people in these coffins. As it continued to be exhibited all across the nation as an artifact from our movement, it caught the eyes of several media including the Smithsonian here in Washington, DC. And in an article, Angela Davis wrote that this, this was the outcry of protest, that this was the symbol that we needed as a nation in order to strip us from our biases and our fears of the other, of each other, and find unity in the sense of looking in the mirror, of facing our truest selves, our clearest selves, our distorted selves. And so this piece became an object, an artifact that was collected into the Smithsonian, the National Museum of African American History and Culture that is here in DC. They purchased it. And it was hard to let it go even as it haunted so many of us back in our hometown of St. Louis. And upon purchasing it, they decided there was a connection, that this was a bridge. This wasn't just a tool. This wasn't just an art form. This wasn't just a direct action or a protest. But it was a link to the same narrative that has been going on in our nation for decades and generations. When we think about Emmett Till and the open-faced casket funeral that he had upon his death after being murdered down south for supposedly whistling at a woman, a white woman. And we think about Mike Brown, who was walking down the street after supposedly robbing a store, a convenience store in his neighborhood. This object and its purchase allowed us to not only ignite a new movement amongst our city, but amongst this, this nation. And it has since funded our ability to continue rising up, putting our bodies on the line, putting our souls into the universe, and putting new ideas and actions to fight back, to fight back, to fight back against all who stand against us.
This guy got a swag bag. I'm telling you. You're in a white tux. And an LA hat. With the LA hat. It's not even a snap back here. So while they're doing that, you guys. Yeah, see, I take that. Just think about it. These people could have been something bigger. Anatomy of a necktie. One, the blade is the lower main section of necktie. If you flip it over, there is a perfect diamond at the cape. Tipping is the fabric sewn onto the backside of the tip and tail of a necktie. Decorative tipping uses a fabric that is different than the shell. Self-tipping uses a fabric that is the same as the shell, and by now you've surely gathered that the shell or envelope of the tie, which often comes in silk, wool, cotton, linen, microfiber, or my personal favorite, polyester, is the part that you most often see. And as you can imagine, tipping is strongly encouraged. Now, my favorite part of the tie is the hem, with the margin a close second. The hem, immortalized by the bottom of Jesus' garment, is the last stitch that connects the shell to the tipping. Consequently, it reminds me of the first time I ever wore a tie sitting upright in the back of a black church. Now, the margin where most of us who do not wear ties on a daily basis live is the distance between the edge and the tipping. And tipping is strongly encouraged, especially when you are on the edge or when your envelope is satin. Most especially when you are black on black and you are desperately trying to make sure your outsides and insides match. There is a slip stitch for when folks always ask how you seem to be keeping it together. Made with a single long thread running the entire length of tie, this hidden stitching holds the two overlapping sides together and helps the necktie regain its shape after repeated wear. This slip stitch is sewn ever so loosely to prevent breakage from repeated knotting. There's the care and origin tag that no one ever reads, the interlining that gives us our shape and stamina, the elastin that gives us that rolled edge some call cool, where the tie goes from front to back. Carefully press, but don't push me. This rolled edge gives us that peace that we need to survive. And every tie has a neck, too. No wonder that the elders called it the white man's noose, but I've never seen the deacons shuffling the chain ganging along during a selection from our choir, shuffling along single file, tie tie to tie. I've only ever seen them own one suit, one button-down shirt, one good pair of shoes, uniform, work boots, and blue collars the rest of the week, but on Sunday, donning technicolor nooses to present themselves humble and thankful in the presence of a blue-eyed God. 
but not Wendell. 20 years young Hova, shell toes to match his shell top tie, my ninja turtle in the making. He couldn't escape the keeper loop, that extra piece of fabric underneath the blade. So when the tail is placed through this loop, it helps to keep the tail out of sight. Two, he has swag, dog. Normally reserved for rappers, pimps, drug dealers, ball players, and other dreams we imagine being able to afford when we grow up. This time, it is a reservation for Wendell's four-piece suit. Fitted cap to boot. Famous top to bottom, toe to tooth, dental records, and toe tags. They are learning that there is a cheaper way to become famous, hashtag forever. He could have been more than a Trayvon, a Tamir, a Kamani, a Kendrick. He could have gotten older. He couldn't have gotten bigger. He could have been more than just another finger. He could have been more than just another. There is an easier way to get a suit that fits without the state-sanctioned alterations, without getting hemmed up. He was dressed to sit behind a CEO desk dressed to be arguing a case instead of catching one, dressed to meet his future spouse, dressed to attend the wedding of his future child, too fly to only wear a suit a handful of times, second to last time he ever wore a tie, lying in the front of a black church.
take a moment. Take a breath. Take time. Take care. Take heart. Take hope. Take a step. Take a chance. Take courage. Take charge. Take a stand. Take pride. Take joy. Take pause. Take a moment. Take a breath. Take what you need. Take what you need. Take what you need. This piece was born out of collaboration, and we're very grateful and thankful to the Kennedy Center for the Citizen Artist Program. When we were conceptualizing what we wanted to do to integrate our talents today, uh, the only ideas we shared came from a profound place of uh, reflection, as you saw with the content from our work, sometimes a profound place of grief. And uh, I know I wanted to add a story to the context when 2012, when I was in South Africa, I had the opportunity to visit the Apartheid Museum in Johannesburg. And if you've ever been to that or a Holocaust museum, you know at the end there's always a moment where they say, don't just go back to your world. Uh, 
there, there, there's something fundamentally uh, wrong with you if you can just go back to your world after witnessing uh, such horrific pieces of our history. And so they build into those museums a piece of reflection. And uh, for us as artists, oftentimes our art serves the same purpose. So we didn't just want to hit you with a whole bunch of information and trauma, even though this is oftentimes how we work through the trauma that happens to us in the world. Everyone has their own process. But for us, we felt important to have these kind of reflective pieces and fortunate to have our comrades here who would help by bearing witness through their talents and saying it's OK. I feel that way sometimes, too. And it just kind of makes us all more human. We title these pieces collectively as Can I Get a Witness? And it comes from that sense of deep empathy that in all of our journeys, all of our walks through life, the things that we experience, the things that we live and feel vicariously through the communities that we are part of and the ones that are afar, that we are forever changed and there is no turning back. In this society right now, more and more, there is a call for us to rise up, to live up to the greatest sense of humanity that we can, that love, that joy, that unity becomes the ways that we resist, that we relearn what it is to be in unison with our environment, with our world, with our neighbors, with our families, with each other. I think heavily about all that's going on in the world right now. Natural disasters left and right our families from coast to coast, country to country. And one of the most beautiful things that happens in these moments where we should feel the greatest despair is that when we, that's when we see the deepest, the greatest depths of who we really are. That when we say stand up and rise up, we do that together that we are for each other despite our differences. And that's why we are called here, as artists, as humans, as neighbors, for this work. We invite you guys to sing along with us, you know, in the tradition of the black church, when we say, can I get a witness, I usually hear an amen, and call and response is usually a big part of that. So. The words are in front of you. We welcome you to join us and bear witness with us through your voice.
Y'all would knock it off. Yeah, thank you. Y'all are cute. Um, I don't know, do we still have time for questions? Do we still have time for questions? Yes. This fine young man here said yes, we have time for questions. If you have any questions for us, um, I just wanna, you know, I do a lot of hype man, front man, rapidy rap stuff sometimes, and I always have to throw it back to the musicians. Uh, can you make some noise, please? Some s select noise, right, please, for uh, Katie Wyatt, you know, for VJ, for Rena. Michelle and Akene, yes, if you missed yesterday, I, I'm sorry. You ought to be jealous, because uh, our other two fellows uh, tore the stage up yesterday, but you can certainly find out more about their work uh, at the uh, Citizen Artist Fellow part of the Kennedy Center site. Questions? So, for, so I'm from China, and um, for us who have just landed here in the USA, uh, from Asia, a lot of times in our streets, we only see people of the same color and the same shade. Kind of, what advice do you have to someone who's new to this country to try to understand these differences? Because it's not something that we learn, you know, as a child. So it's all been a surprise. Any advice would be great. Yeah, that is a that is such a humbling question, and I, I thank you for for asking that uh, from from us. Radical listening. I think right now, in this world, one of the greatest things that we can give to each other is an ear and, and a, a listening heart to, to like not listen to respond, but to hear people out, to meet them where they are without judgment, without pre-assumptions of who they are, what they've done, or who they might become. And one of the things, one of the most beautiful things is that no matter who we are and where we've been, there's a unique story within us. And through those stories, there's that, that connective tissue. So connect with people around you through listening. Talk to strangers. Say hello to that person who looks like, you know, they may have had a hard day. Say hi to those people who everyone else walks past. Let them know that they are not invisible. And I, 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 my wish for you in, in return is that you will be blessed. This young lady down front, there it is. I mean, sorry. <laughs> Stop. <laughs> um. <laughs> Thank you. This is really beautiful. And to, to um, uh, see all of you on stage together and see how everything flowed and connected was just really beautiful to see. I had a question for Dee about that casket, which is beautiful. Um, have you thought of reproducing it? Um, I see that as just one of many that um, can be just spread out <laughs> all over the nation. So I, I just wanted to ask that question. Yeah, I, I'm glad that you, that you asked about that casket um, because when it was collected by the Smithsonian, they, they bought it. And our first response was to use that funding to contribute back to the movement. And being the optimist that we are, we knew that we wanted to create a smaller icon. That thing that you saw is extremely heavy, like heavier than a, a regular casket because of all the grouting, all of the mirrors, all of the materials in it. And what we've decided to do, in addition to supporting all of these other efforts and projects and direct actions, especially as St. Louis continues to be a very tense place right now as we await yet another trial of a police officer who killed a young person, a young person of color in our streets, was that these can become the markers, that for each site, for each community, that they have that type of symbol. The, the, the question of that or the, the how of that is what we're still figuring out collectively. 
because there are just so many immediate calls to respond to all of these social um, and hyper-local issues that are going on. But yes, that is definitely uh, a desire. That is definitely something that is in our collective pipeline. Hi, thank you so much for uh, just being artists and being able to reflect what's been going on and help us experience that in a, in a more reflective way. Uh, nobody can do it like artists can, and I, wow, thank you. And I have my question today is for uh, Rena. Your, um, your music was such, um, so much like a lament, and I just wondered how you developed that music with your team members as, as you were developing the project. Well, there are two. There are two parts of it. One was kind of the the Indian singing, and then one part was the was take what you need at the end. And and um, the the first part it was just very improvisatory and comes out of work that Vijay and I have done with each other um, over the years and more recently. And the second part actually is um, is is from our community. Um, we both are work with Street Symphony. We are you know uh, we have this community that we work with and. Um, I really wanted to develop a piece that was not just um, about homelessness or incarceration, which are the populations that we work with. I really wanted to develop a piece that was for and by and with the people who were experiencing these things in their lives. And so um, and this piece, I mean, this is the first time I have ever sung the piece. Normally it's sung by um, musicians that we have in, in Los Angeles, professional musicians, and then community musicians. And it's always the professional musicians who sing the call and the community musicians who sing the response. Um, and actually, I, I was just thinking as, as I was on stage how the first time we did this, we did it with a... Um, a quartet from LA Master Chorale, and um, the alto said, it's, it's really, you should never have one person on a part because someone will start crying and then it's gonna ruin the harmony. And I was thinking of that as, as I was singing because it's very hard to sing, sing this piece. Um, it's, it's a year old and it's been through um, so many different uh, versions and has had so many different people tell their stories and, and share in the middle of the piece. And so it carries, you know, we, the two of us are standing here on this stage, but it carries the weight of hundreds of people who have contributed and built this piece. And if, if I can add to that, one of the perspectives we had for the music tonight was that in the soul of Can I Get a Witness, we wanted the music not just to be something else that's played at you or not something else that's just played at our colleagues, but that the music in and of itself becomes a place to receive, becomes a place to reflect, becomes a place to metabolize our grief. And so the lament very much came from that place. I mean, what else do we say when we lose words, when we experience the horror uh, of what our lives and our communities experience in Ferguson? except to say we are here with you and we see you and we acknowledge you and we love you and we want to make music with you. And to that end, the, the piece that Reen and I moved into was a saraband written in the 17, uh, let's see, what would it have been? Probably in the early 1700s by Johann Sebastian Bach after his first wife died. And so uh, Rina actually did a Hindustani vocal improvisation over the music of Bach. And in that sense, it's a lament from 300 years ago and a lament from a culture that's 3,000 or more years old that matters now. And I think that that's kind of our call as artists, echoing what Dee said, is that we exist and participate in a culture, and yet it is also our responsibility to create cultures that are restorative right now. And those are the conversations that we've been having here as citizen artists here at the Kennedy Center. <laughs> so many questions. Thank you, folks. Please be patient. The microphone is coming around. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Hi there. Much. That was awesome. Thanks for sharing with us. Um, I have a question for Hakeem. Hi. Hi. Um, can you talk more about the workshop? Is it a workshop of young men? Yeah. That was interesting. Yes. Thank. Thank you for asking. Um, yes. It, it was. A, it's a workshop. This was my first production that's not a works in progress production of that. It's a longer show. It's um, three more of those videos that are excerpts from their conversation. 
Uh, I got a little bit of funding to convene young men kind of around just discussing manhood. It wasn't actually intended to be about the intersection between black male bodies and police violence. It actually was just like, hey, I think our notions of manhood as young men in 2015 is very different than our dads and our grandparents. Hopefully it's evolved a little bit. Let's get together and kind of discuss it. And then Dylan Roof happened two days before and it hijacked our conversation. Um, it was supposed to be multiple talking circles with men. Um, that would be b with, uh, where I live in New Mexico, there's not a huge amount of African American people. So with Latino, Hispanic men and Chicano men, we were gonna do one with native men and we were gonna do one with men who identify as LGBTQ. And so that was really just the beginning. But uh, because of current events, it became necessary to create something faster. When we do it in New Mexico, I actually bring some of those young men to facilitate the Q&A, right? And so that they get to actually bring their voice to the conversation. What I was struck by after Mike Brown and after the succession of, of deaths that have always been a succession of deaths, but now they're on TV. Um, I was like, we're always talking about young men dying and then all the talking heads are my age. So what would happen if we actually asked them how they felt about seeing people who look like them die on TV every day? So that was the source of the pictures that came from that. All right, we have time for one more question. I actually have two questions. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll, okay, one question. Um, probably the, the bigger one between the two. Um, this is for the panel, so anybody can answer. Um, I know that um, um, my heart bleeds for what's happening right now in my present um, as far as what's happening in civil society. Um, I'm a law student, um, so on a daily basis, I am constantly thinking about um, how to engage and how to intersect what's happening in my present um, as someone who will be a lawyer, but also someone right now that's in the fold of, of uh, political and legal conversations. So I ask you as artists, um, but also people that um, you know, touch society with different talents um, and your voice is heard in different atmospheres. How could someone like myself or even the next person um, go through a process where they think, this is how I can contribute, this is what I can give, this is how I matter to this moment, to this present, and I know personally um, even with the resources around me, with people around me that are willing to have conversations, I even feel stuck and sometimes I don't know how I matter to this moment. I, have, I actually have a response, but I would quote someone else. Maestro Obreu is the founder of El Sistema, which is a system of youth orchestras that started in Venezuela in the 70s and is now worldwide. And one of the things he said was that you're too late if you're not starting now. And none of the preparation in the world will, will prepare you for a perfect response. And so it's most important that you begin. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that certainly is how a lot of the Sistema programs began in the United States with people who didn't have a lot of training, with people who were really interested in just doing something and feeling as if they, need, they wanted to matter and wanted to contribute in some way but weren't sure how. Um, and so I, I would say a lot, of, I, I certainly just began and, and I, I would just, um, another thing we've been talking a lot is about is what is a citizen artist? And what we've really come around to is that we are all citizen artists and that includes you. And what is your, what can you contribute? I'd love to know. Um, I thank you for the question. And so much of what we have created as artists, once we get funding, is an ivory tower, <laughs> or a marble tower, or a stainless steel tower. And I feel like we've done the same thing in the siloing of how we define citizenship as well. And so what we understand as a vital role for artists is to be bridge makers. And in a sense, even disruptors. We have a lot of conversation around the arts as healing, but I don't feel we have enough conversation around the arts as disruption and arts as provocation. 
And so it's our job to provoke, and it's our also, uh, also our job to heal once we provoke. Um, I'm very lucky to serve on the board of Americans for the Arts, and you actually have a couple of folks from Americans for the Arts here in the audience. And I am blown away by and amazed by the work that happens from the team at Americans for the Arts that is about diversity, equity, and inclusion, specifically around cultural equity. And that gives us many different entry points across the country that actually then get reported back to legislators and lawmakers. Um, not only about sustaining the arts, but also how the arts feed business um, and create pathways that legislators care about. Um, so the questions that I think we're asking are, how do the arts affect the ways that we start conversations around policy change? Um, and I feel like we're hoping for that consciousness shift to happen. And if we are really gonna be dealers in the shifts of consciousness, then we also have to be prepared to have the conversations across the aisle once those shifts do happen and be ready, be ready to be following up on them, even without the instruments in our hands. Mm -hmm. So that's what I would offer. Does anyone else wanna say yeah, something to that? If I could add like some very tangible things through a law lens. I'm not a lawyer, I'm a social worker. She just um, plays one on TV. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so using my, my own experience um, in, in context as uh, a case study, a, an example, um, when we all came out in mass in St. Louis and Ferguson, a lot of us didn't have a clue what we were gonna do. Um, but showing up, showing up is powerful. Uh, so find the ways that you can show up for the people, with the people, for the causes, about the causes uh, that, you, that are really on your heart. As a lawyer, one of the things that was very beautiful, because in, in our context in, in St. Louis, we have a lot of direct actions that, are, that we consider as a code red, meaning they are arrestable um, actions. And people enter into them knowing that there's the possibility that I may go to jail for, for this. And lawyers across our city and region have risen up, and law students, uh, risen up to one, not only create uh, a really supportive bail fund for a lot of the organizers, protesters, and leaders, and clergy, especially the clergy, who are putting their, their real being, their status, their reputations, and their lives on the line uh, for these causes and to stand in solidarity. But in addition to that, a lot of legal teams are stepping in to say, well, I'm gonna volunteer pro bono time to support you. And I'm gonna find ways to, to make sure that you know what your rights are so that as you are uh, taking to the streets or rising up, raising voices, uh, mobilizing people, that you know the, the limitations, the barriers, and the opportunities of um, how you can do this effectively. And so I, I think lawyers can uh, provide a lot of insight into this process uh, as we not only tackle issues like police brutality, but also immigration and uh, trans issues and LGBT issues, women's issues. There are states now that uh, will allow women to be arrested or fired from their jobs if they are on birth control. Like standing up for rights, I, I think, takes a lot of forms. And I think you're well positioned to do that now as well as when uh, you receive that degree. Hmm. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.